This capsule will zoom in on policies to improve child well-being. It will focus on five topics, mainly social protection, child-sensitive social protection, the impact of social protection on children, how this impact is measured and evaluated, and finally, child budgeting. Let's begin with considering what social protection is. Social protection is concerned with protecting and helping those who are poor, vulnerable, marginalized, or dealing with risks. Interventions aim to protect people who live in poverty from the harsh consequences of living in poverty. This protection also aims to prevent people from falling into poverty when they experience a shock that either stops them from earning an income or that costs a lot of money, such as an illness or a flood, and to help people out of poverty. Given this broad remit, objectives of social protection vary widely and range from poverty reduction, human capital investment, economic strengthening, to women's empowerment. There is no single definition of social protection. Different organizations and agencies establish the scope and remit of social protection in line with their own mandates and priority areas. A commonly used and broad definition of social protection provided by Devereux and Sabates Wheeler in their 2004 paper reads, Social protection describes all public and private initiatives that provide income or consumption transfers to the poor, protect the vulnerable against livelihood risks, and enhance the social status and rights of the marginalized, with the overall objective of reducing the economic and social vulnerability of poor, vulnerable, and marginalized groups. In other words, social protection can be understood as programs that aim to support those living in poverty by providing them with cash or food transfers that protects everyone who is vulnerable against livelihood risks, such as an illness or unemployment, and that helps to improve the status of those who are excluded and marginalized. A more recent 2019 definition that was agreed upon by many international organizations under the umbrella of the Social Protection Interagency Cooperation Board, SPIAC-B, states, Social protection is a set of policies and programs aimed at preventing and protecting all people against poverty, vulnerability, and social exclusion throughout their life cycle, placing a particular emphasis on vulnerable groups. This protection can be provided through social insurance, tax-funded social benefits, social assistance services, public works programs, and other schemes guaranteeing basic income security and access to essential services. We can understand the remit of social protection even better by looking at the types of interventions that are included. They are commonly divided into three main categories, social assistance, social insurance, and labor market interventions. Social assistance includes interventions that provide basic transfers and that would mostly be associated with the objectives of protection. They are also referred to as non-contributory as one doesn't have to pay into the scheme in order to get support. Examples include cash transfers and school feeding programs. Social insurance refers to interventions that provide support in case a shock happens. This type of social protection is linked to the objective of prevention. They are also referred to as contributory interventions because one has to pay into the scheme in order to benefit. Examples in some countries include health insurance or unemployment insurance. Labor market interventions focus on getting people into work. This can be formal or informal types of work. They can therefore be linked to the objective of promotion. There are many different forms of interventions and they can range from skills training to public works programs. Social protection encompasses interventions that are implemented by all actors, including governments, communities, and non-government organizations, NGOs. It should be noted, though, that most of the focus within social protection is on public or government-provided interventions, also referred to as formal social protection. These four types of interventions are commonly used in developing countries. 
Unconditional cash transfers represent regular cash transfers to households or individuals that aim to cover basic needs and support a basic standard of living. They tend to be paid every month or every two months, but this varies greatly between countries and the regularity of payments largely depends on the robustness of national social protection systems. They are called unconditional because there is no behavioral requirement attached to their payment. Beneficiaries do not have to engage in certain activities to make sure that they receive their transfers. Unconditional cash transfers are usually targeted to the poorest and most vulnerable groups in society. Targeting may be based on an assessment of wealth or income, or can be based on demographic characteristics that are closely related to poverty or vulnerability, such as age or disability status. Conditional cash transfers are regular cash transfers to households or individuals that aim to cover basic needs and support a basic standard of living. They also tend to be paid every month or every two months, just like unconditional cash transfers. They are called conditional because there is a behavioral requirement that beneficiaries have to comply with in order to receive the transfer. For example, children need to attend school or receive immunizations. Most conditions aim to promote behavior that improves outcomes for children or social development. Transfers are therefore usually handed out to parents or caregivers. Like unconditional cash transfers, conditional cash transfers also tend to be targeted to the poorest and most vulnerable groups in society. In addition, because of the types of conditions that are attached, they are usually directed to families with children. Cash Plus programs offer complementary services in addition to the cash transfer. This can include in-kind benefits, such as nutritional supplements, provision of information or sensitization, through behavioral change communications, for example, or psychosocial support, such as through social workers that are part of the cash transfer program. The rationale for the Cash Plus program is based on the notion that income alone is not enough to achieve positive change. School feeding programs provide meals to children at school with the objectives of increasing enrollment and attendance and reducing dropout rates, as well as improving nutritional status of children. A recent trend towards homegrown school feeding replaces imported food aid with local purchases and creates a structured demand that also benefits local farmers. As a result, income for farmers increases and also employment is generated, such as for the women who prepare the meals. Although there are no explicit conditions attached to receiving school feeding, it could still be considered a conditional program as the child needs to attend school in order to benefit from the scheme. Children who are most marginalized may therefore experience a double disadvantage. They are excluded from school and from receiving school meals. The World Bank defines social insurance as programs are contributory interventions that are designed to help individuals manage sudden changes in income because of old age, sickness, disability, or natural disaster. Individuals pay insurance premiums to be eligible for coverage or contribute a percentage of their earnings to a mandatory insurance scheme. Shocks can be covariant. In other words, affect many people at the same time, such as floods, drought, or conflict. Or they can be idiosyncratic, meaning that they affect individuals, such as illness or unemployment related to life course events like retirement, pregnancy, and old age. Schemes are funded through individual or household contributions in combination with government, employer, or development assistance support. Labor market interventions are usually non-contributory and can be divided into active and passive interventions. Active interventions focus primarily on trying to get people into employment. This can include jobs in the formal or informal labor market. Passive interventions support people when they lose employment, such as non-contributory unemployment benefits. Public works programs are schemes that provide temporary work. Often this constitutes work for a limited period of time or a maximum number of days, 
such as six months per year during the lean season. Participants receive either cash or food in return for work, or sometimes a combination of both. Therefore, these programs are sometimes referred to as cash for work or food for work programs. Through the work that is delivered, public works programs can help to build infrastructure such as roads or irrigation channels. Sometimes they can also help to provide services such as childcare services in the community. If programs focus on more skilled types of work, they can also support skill building of its participants. Generally, public works programs are targeted at those living in poverty but who are able to work. Often wages or benefit levels are set at a low level so that only poor people are attracted to these programs. We discuss public works as part of labor market policies, but they are also often categorized as social assistance. Public works programs can have different objectives. They can provide income after a one-time shock, such as a drought or a flood. They can provide a buffer against seasonal hunger. They can serve as a scheme that provides guaranteed employment for a certain number of days per year, or they can serve as a mechanism for reintegrating an individual back into the labor market. In this overview of main objectives for programs across the world, we can see that these objectives differ across regions. Employment guarantee is a common objective of public works programs in South Asia, while provision of income after a one-time shock is the most prevalent objective in Latin America and the Caribbean and in East Asia and the Pacific. Graduation programs are a relatively new wave of comprehensive programs that focus on moving people out of poverty. It promotes the establishment of economic and entrepreneurial activities, such as setting up small trading businesses. By providing people with intense support, the program aims to graduate people out of poverty which is why these programs are called graduation programs. They are often short-term and only provide support for a limited amount of time, generally between 18 and 24 months. Programs target people who are living in extreme poverty, but who are able to work and to be entrepreneurial. At present, programs are mostly implemented by NGOs. They started in Bangladesh, but have become popular across the world in low- and middle-income countries. The concept of Child Sensitive Social Protection, CSSP, first emerged in 2009 when a group of international organizations, including UNICEF, World Bank, ILO, DFID, Save the Children, and others, published the Joint Statement on Advancing Child-Sensitive Social Protection. In the last decade, the field of CSSP has developed further with additional definitions and approaches having been developed by various international agencies and organizations, notably Save the Children and UNICEF. At the core of all approaches lies the notion that CSSP aims to maximize positive impacts on children as well as minimize any unintended harm or adverse consequences for children. This means that CSSP does not only apply to interventions that are targeted at children or households with children, but that it extends to all programs that can affect children. In other words, CSSP is not a distinct type of social protection, but instead offers a framework for guiding all aspects of design and implementation of social protection through a children's lens. The Global Coalition to End Child Poverty identified various steps to operationalize CSSP in their 2017 briefing paper. First, seek to maximize positive impacts on children's rights and well-being while minimizing or avoiding any adverse impacts on them. Second, analyze and monitor on an ongoing basis the impacts of interventions on children in each context by age, gender, and different types of vulnerability and ability. Third, take meaningful practical steps starting at the local level to seek out and take into account 
the views and perspectives of children and their caregivers on the design and impacts of policies and programs. This slide includes an assessment of the child sensitivity of social protection in Nepal, undertaken in collaboration with Save the Children in Nepal. This research used secondary information to assess the extent to which key social protection programs contributed positively or negatively to a range of children's outcomes. Using a traffic light system, the table indicates whether reported impacts were positive overall, whether positive effects were balanced against negative effects, or whether the impact was unclear. Findings indicate that while programs that are geared specifically to improve children's outcomes, such as a scholarship program, had mixed effects, a scheme that was not focused on children, old age pension, has mostly positive effects. In this case, the very small amounts awarded through the scholarship scheme offered no substantial benefit. The old age pension, however, was often used by beneficiaries to support their grandchildren. Social protection and child protection are often confused and conflated. Although there are strong overlaps between both policy areas, they also differ in important ways. Two definitions of child protection are provided on this slide. Poverty and economic vulnerability are important factors in causing or reinforcing child protection violations. Given social protections remit to address poverty, it can help prevent child protection violations, for example, cash transfers reducing poverty-induced stress, which in turn reduces intra-household tensions and violence, as well as support recovery and redress, for example, cash transfers to support family reintegration. The potential for linkages between social protection and child protection also exist in operational terms, with the frontline response to issues of poverty and vulnerability, as well as child protection concerns, often being provided by social workers or the community. Practically, this means that social workers who are employed as part of interventions, such as Cash Plus programs, also respond to child protection violations, either by intervening at a family level or making referrals to other services. Vice versa, it could also mean that social workers who are primarily responsible for child protection, such as responding to domestic abuse and child neglect, are tasked with administration of social assistance interventions. Nevertheless, core areas of child protection, such as systems of alternative care and legal frameworks underpinning justice for and security of children, are firmly beyond the remit of social protection. Folding child protection into social protection, or vice versa, risks a dilution of each policy area's focus in unhelpful ways. We will now discuss the impact of cash transfers on children. The graph on this slide reports the proportion of studies that reported positive and significant impacts of cash transfers on a range of outcomes for children. For example, out of 35 studies that considered the impact of cash transfers on household expenditures, 71% found a positive and significant impact. These findings refer to cash transfer programs at large, not necessarily only those targeted at children. We can observe two things from this graph. First, there are far fewer studies available for areas related to ultimate outcomes for children, such as learning or nutritional results in terms of anthropometric measures. Instead, most of the evidence that is available focuses on so-called proximate outcomes, such as school attendance or dietary diversity. In other words, we have relatively less information about the impact of cash transfers on children's development and well-being. Second, even when taking into account that fewer studies are available, we can see that cash transfers are less likely to have an impact on ultimate outcomes related to learning and nutrition. Out of all the studies available, only 40% point to a significantly positive impact on learning, and fewer than that report positive nutritional outcomes. 
The bar graph on this slide presents the impact of two different cash transfer schemes on children's engagement with work. The Bono de Desarrollo Humano program in Ecuador and the social cash transfer scheme in Malawi. It shows that the effects differ depending on the types of work that are considered. Overall, cash transfers reduce children's engagement with paid work outside of the home, both in Ecuador and Malawi. This is due to the income effect. The increase of family income as a result of the cash transfer means that there is less need for children to contribute. At the same time, children increase time spent on domestic chores, which is the case for girls and boys in Malawi. This can be explained by the substitution effect. The cash transfer may increase productive activities among adults, such as trading on the market, requiring children to do more household chores. It should be noted that we should not automatically assume that this is a bad thing for children. These findings do not indicate whether this increased engagement crowds out time spent on education, for example. This slide presents results from an evaluation that estimated the impact of participating in the National Health Insurance Scheme in Ghana on children's schooling and work. The findings show that participation in the health insurance improves school enrollment and attendance. Interestingly, in contrast to the previous slide, engagement with household chores decreases. This could be explained by the fact that engagement with household chores may have been higher to begin with. Indeed, the negative effect on chores goes hand in hand with increased enrollment. Authors also hypothesize that health insurance reduces the need for children to be pulled out of school and do household chores as adults go out of the house to work in the case of a health shock. Hence, here the substitution effect works the other way round. Because the health insurance reduces the strain on family resources, it reduces the need for children to engage with household chores as their parents are working outside the home. The graph in this slide provides an overview of the impact of graduation programs on different aspects of child development. The blue bar denotes the number of studies available that included evidence on this topic and the orange bar represents the number of studies that point to positive effects. We can observe the greatest number of studies in the areas of nutrition, health, and education. In line with findings for cash transfers previously, most of these studies consider and find significantly positive impacts on intermediate outcomes, such as dietary diversity or school enrollment. Little evidence is available about ultimate outcomes such as nutritional status or learning. Few studies have considered aspects of safety and security and no studies have looked into the impact of graduation programs on responsive caregiving or early learning. In this next section, we will look at how impact is measured and evaluated. Many evaluations of social protection programs start by considering their theory of change. The theory of change spells out and makes explicit what the program provides and how it expected to lead to certain kinds of changes. This diagram provides a hypothetical example for school feeding programs. The theory of change starts by stipulating the input that is provided or the support that is given to the beneficiaries. In the case of school feeding, this constitutes food that will be cooked and given to children at school. The process refers to the process of implementation. In this example, this would include the procurement process for buying the food. For example, is it bought centrally by the government and distributed to schools, or do schools buy it from local farmers, as well as the cooking and handling of the food? Outcomes include immediate effects of the support provided. School meals mean that children may eat more food and that they attend school more regularly. These are the intermediate outcomes that we referred to earlier. Short and long-term impacts follow this intermediate effect, such as improving children's weight or increasing their test scores. Spelling out this theory of change provides important guidance for evaluators to ensure an evaluation design that gives insight into whether the program has the intended impact or not, 
And if so, why was this the impact? This slide includes an example of a theory of change for a Cash Plus program in Tanzania. The inputs and processes are presented in the bubbles at the top, reflecting the intervention's different components. These include cash transfers, livelihood enhancement activities, education on sexual and reproductive health, and youth-friendly services. Moving down the diagram, the white boxes include outputs, or the assets that beneficiaries acquire, such as savings or knowledge about HIV AIDS. Intermediate outcomes include enhanced social networks and reduced stress, while mid- and long-term outcomes include improved mental health and reduced risk of HIV AIDS. A notable observation from this diagram is that exact terminology and framing of theories of change may differ. Inputs and processes are not always separated, and sometimes outcomes and impacts that may take effect in shorter or longer term are pulled apart or lumped together. The overall logic, however, remains the same and gives an important understanding of how the social protection program is envisioned to affect change. It provides a causal model of change. As you can see in this slide, not all the information collected and analyzed to understand whether the social protection works as envisioned in the theory of change belongs to the process of evaluation. Evaluation primarily focuses on investigating whether the combination of inputs, processes, and outputs leads to certain outcomes or impacts. It is also vital to gain insight into whether the intervention was implemented as intended. For example, were cash transfers made on time and in full? What type of food was delivered and when? How many visits made by case managers did beneficiaries receive? This kind of information is captured through monitoring. It often stands apart from evaluation as it is conducted by the implementing agency and is commonly automated using a management information system, MIS. Most evaluations of social protection programs are based on observing actual changes as a result of implementation. They ask, how has the outcome changed as a result of the policy or program? Impacts are therefore estimated after the fact, or ex post. But one might want to get an insight into the potential impact of an intervention before implementing it, or assess how different policy options may lead to different results. In this case, a question of interest is, what would the outcome be if a new program was introduced? This requires a simulation of impacts before the rollout of an intervention, or an ex ante analysis. This slide shows the effect of taxes and transfers in OECD and ECLAC countries. The combined light and dark blue bars indicate poverty rates and Gini coefficients before taxes and transfers are in place, and the light blue bars represent the situation after taxes and transfers. In almost all cases, poverty and inequality is lower after taxes and transfers, meaning that they have a positive redistributive effect. It is important to note that the estimation of these effects is based on simulations. Poverty and inequality before taxes and transfers cannot actually be observed. Instead, using household survey data, taxes and transfers are removed from household wealth aggregates underpinning poverty and inequality calculations. This slide provides an illustration of the process of simulation. Imagine a household with an income of 80 currency units per month. We are wanting to understand whether a cash transfer will lift this family, and indeed others in the population of interest, out of poverty. A fictional cash transfer amount, in this case of 30 currency units, is added to the household's income, amounting to a fictional total income of 110 currency units. If the poverty line were 100 currency units per month, this household can now be assumed to have moved out of poverty. When doing the same for all households in the population or sample, we can estimate the potential effect of introducing a cash transfer or tax. 
It should be noted that this example assumes that there is no substitution effect. Many simulation exercises assume that a transfer might lower original income, freeing up time for childcare, for example, and so the new total income might be assumed to be 105 instead of 110 currency units, for example. An ex-ante micro-simulation was undertaken in Lesotho to guide decisions about changes in their social protection system. Various packages of support with different types and sizes of transfers were compared against the current situation, against not having any social protection, against each other. Package 1 includes cash transfers for infants, children, older people, people with disabilities, and those in extreme poverty. Transfers are also assumed to be indexed for inflation based on historic inflation rates. This table shows the results from the simulation exercise in Lesotho. The top lines show that the estimated poverty rate and poverty gap, if there were no social protection, amounts to 59.9 and 23.8% respectively. It also provides these numbers for the current situation with social protection, with the poverty rate being 57.1% and the poverty gap amounting to 19.5%. This shows us that poverty would increase if no form of social protection were provided. Simulation of the effects of Package 1 shows that the various schemes would cover 71.67% of the population overall. The poverty rate and poverty gap are estimated to drop to 49.93 and 13.6% respectively. This represents a significant decrease compared to the current situation. Comparing the estimated costs of these interventions against the current situation allows for calculating the cost-benefit ratio. In this case, the ratio is 0 0.481. The example from Lesotho was relatively simple. Although the exercise simulated the introduction of multiple transfers, it did not assume any changes in people's behavior, such as substituting some of their original income with the transfer. It is possible to develop simulation models that do account for changes in people's behavior, as is the case in this model that was used to estimate rates of return on investment with social protection in Cambodia. The model accounts for how changes in household consumption following the receipt of transfers leads to changes in school attendance, nutritional outcomes, and labor participation, which in turn impact household consumption and affects poverty and inequality. Models that take account of these behavioral changes and multiplier effects represent a closer approximation of how people respond to social protection and therefore may provide more accurate insights into the impacts of social protection. At the same time, all calculations are based on assumptions about behavior, and with every assumption there is a risk that error creeps into the model. Simulation models can provide a helpful indication to guide decision-making, but should never be used in isolation. Ex-post impact evaluation has two methodological prerequisites. First, outcomes of interest need to be assessed before and after implementation to allow for observing change over time. Second, outcomes of interest need to be assessed for those who receive social protection support, the treatment group, and those who do not receive support, the control group. This is necessary to establish a counterfactual and to rule out that any changes over time were due to factors other than social protection support. This requires the control group to be as similar as possible to the treatment group. In this type of evaluation, impact is estimated using the difference in differences technique. This example shows the simple regression equation to operationalize this technique. Capital Y is the outcome, capital T is the treatment or participation in the program. T is the time trend and X is the wealth index to control for significant differences in wealth between the treatment and the control. B captures the treatment group's specific effect, 
to account for average permanent differences between the treatment and the control. C captures the effect of the time trend, and D is the true effect of the treatment, or the treatment effect. This estimation allows for controlling all observable and unobservable time invariant variables that influence program participation and the outcome. One would use a generalized least squares, GLS, regression model for continuous outcomes and a logit model for binary outcome variables. The establishment of a counterfactual that allows for isolating program effects and ruling out other reasons for changes in outcomes over time is vital for impact evaluation. There are various ways to establish a counterfactual. Establishing a random sample and undertaking a randomized control trial is the gold standard in impact evaluation. Allocating individuals to treatments into control groups randomly ensures that both groups share the same characteristics and can be compared like for like. Practical constraints and ethical considerations may not make it possible to use random sampling. Statistical techniques such as propensity score matching or regression discontinuity design can help to create control groups that are equal enough to the treatment group to allow for robust impact estimates. The method of propensity score matching seeks out individuals in the control group that match individuals in the treatment group to the best extent possible based on propensity scores or the likelihood to be treated. Regression discontinuity design is premised on the idea that there is a cutoff that distinguishes between those receiving support and those who do not. Those closest to this cutoff are deemed comparable. Both the ex ante and ex post impact evaluation methods presented so far rely solely on quantitative data. They are also entirely guided by the theory of change, assessing whether social protection has or may have the desired impact. This diagram illustrates a broader evaluation framework that recognizes the non-linearities and complexities that surround social protection, its implementation, and its impacts. Social protection may have effects that were not foreseen in the theory of change, and could have unintended consequences or leave its mark on the wider community. In turn, these could affect the impact of social protection. Understanding how and why programs have an impact or not is vital for learning from evaluations. Doing so requires a more comprehensive evaluation framework that looks out of the box and incorporates qualitative and other forms of data. This final section introduces budgeting for children. Policies for children can only be implemented if there is a sufficient budget. Budgeting for children refers to the process of allocation of public funds to policies and programs that benefit children. This includes many forms of social protection, but also wider social policies such as education and health as well as child-specific interventions around child protection. It also requires that those public funds are spent well by responding to children's and caregivers' needs. We will discuss these elements in turn. In many low-income countries, policies are funded by donors or external funds, making policies vulnerable to short-term funding cycles and changes in funding priorities. The creation of fiscal space and ensuring that national governments have the financial resources to fund policies for children is vital for sustainable policy making. This is especially true for social protection. Despite social protection programs being evaluated in proven anti-poverty strategies, most children are not covered by social protection and the coverage is lowest where the need is the highest. A range of options is available for creating fiscal space for policies that benefit children. This ranges from reallocating funds from other sectors or budget lines to more child-friendly sectors, increasing revenue through taxes to manage debt and illicit financial flows. Which of these options are most appropriate will depend on context and is in the hands of the Ministry of Finance as opposed to ministries that work on issues for children but with input from the social sector ministries. Here are a range of options to create fiscal space. 
Regardless of how much fiscal space is available, it is vital to gain insight into the proportion of the public budget being allocated to policies that benefit children. Child budgets, child budgeting, child-centric budgets, children's budgets, public finance for children are all terms to describe this kind of analysis. Note that they do not refer to separate budgets. In other words, governments don't have earmarked child budgets. Instead, it refers to an analysis of which lines within an average budget are dedicated to policies that benefit children and what proportion of the overall public budget this constitutes. The making of a government's budget is generally a carefully planned and executed process with persons at different levels involved in its formulation. Step one in child budgeting is to collect information about the budget cycle. This example from India shows that the budget cycle has four stages. Formulation of the budget is followed by its legislative approval before being executed and finally audited and assessed. A whole host of documentation can provide useful insight. Most crucially, this includes the actual budgets with detailed breakdowns of the expenditures by ministries and departments surveys, action plans in relation to children, and reports from within government and external partners who hold government to account, all add information about whether public budget is used to the benefit of children and how much is used. Step two in child budgeting is to identify relevant ministries or departments for children. This can be undertaken before, simultaneously, or after step one and will depend on the capacity of the persons involved as well as the nature of the information received. In the example of India, programs for children are spread over many ministries, including health and family welfare, school education and literacy, and women and child development. Step three entails marking line items within the budget documents of each ministry and department that are meant for children specifically. Step four is to cluster the programs into sectoral categories. These are large categories that correspond with major sectors such as health, education, and child protection. The final steps include data entry, analysis, and presentation of findings. Step three of marking out line items that are meant for children is a painstaking exercise and forms the foundation of the data analysis. One of the major challenges in analyzing and monitoring budget-related data for children is the selection of programs and schemes that are aimed at 0 to 18-year-olds. This is particularly complex for certain areas which may cut across sectors. For example, child protection-related issues or early childhood development. The HAQ, Center for Child Rights in India, suggests taking into account schemes and sectors that are specifically aimed at children or that fit within the sectoral categories identified above but do not specify the exact age group aimed for. For example, programs related to mother and child health or youth and sports. This child budget from Pakistan provides an example of what a child budget might look like after all the steps are completed. In Punjab, children receive most of the focus in the education sector although with large differences across the years. Comparatively, budget allocation to schemes that benefit children in health and social welfare are low and worryingly going down. The higher allocation for children in the education sector in 2010-11 was attributed to special programs that were initiated in the province of Punjab in 2010. No such programs were put into place in other sectors. To ensure that children's rights are met, it is not only vital to have enough money available and for it to be allocated to schemes that experts deem of benefit to children, it is also crucial that some budget is assigned in response to children and caregivers' needs and priorities. Participatory budgeting refers to a process whereby children and or adults are consulted on how the budget should be allocated. Despite civil society organizations having campaigned for budgeting to include participatory processes, the practice of participatory budgeting remains limited. This can be attributed to technical, attitudinal, and practical challenges. 
However, as pointed out by civil society, such participatory processes will not only increase transparency and accountability, they are also likely to make policies and interventions more relevant and effective. This final slide shows that children express a desire to be involved in budgeting and for their voices to be taken into account. Almost 9 out of 10 children think that the government should take their views into account and more than three quarters of children would feel comfortable being part of this process. Children should never be underestimated in their motivation and capacity to be agents of change.